It's good to be up here. It's good to be with you today. Um, as always, it's good to be bringing you God's Word uh, this morning. Uh, if you don't already know me, my name is Dave. I'm a part of the team here. I have the privilege of watching over our youth and young adults, and uh, it's my joy to do that uh, week by week and month by month. Now, uh, some of our youth might be in the service today as well, because we kind of wrapped up some of our uh, youth programs, so it's great to have young people in the service. I'll try not to be too boring. It's good. Uh, now, as we enter today's message, uh, there's probably a few helpful things to know, because we're kind of launching into this amazing section in Matthew 24. And as you uh, probably know, we're in our series, Kingdom Come, which is a great title for today's message, because we, ha we have a lot to do with God's kingdom coming. And uh, we want to skip to that, but not yet, not yet. Um, now, we've just been in a pretty intense section of Scripture where Jesus is correcting the kind of religious gatekeepers, and it's uh, this series of woes and corrections and rebukes. So that's pretty intense. And then just after our Matthew 24 passage, we hear these amazing parables of the end, of of what happens kind of at the end of judgment. So we are kind of launched right between these two things. Whoa, right? Oh no. And like judgment. So that's where we are today. Welcome youth and happy Father's Day. But yes, it is a happy Father's Day. Uh, for me, as, as a foster dad, as a foster dad, I, I also want to bring not just the, the good happy news, right? The good happy news, but I also need to bring the hard news, the hard reality. And that's kind of what our passage does today. It kind of brings hard news and good news together. And for me, as a foster dad, I want to see the kids healthy and learning and loved. But to be able to get there, the truth is required. Hard news is required. Now, as kind of a silly example of this, um, in my house, we like Star Wars. We, we love Star Wars, and the kids mostly love the battles. They love the battles of Star Wars. Now, as anyone who's, who's watched any sort of action movie or fantasy movie, it sometimes takes a while to get to the action, doesn't it? To, the, to get to the, the good part. Now, I have one kid in particular who just loves lightsabers. He loves lightsabers. Now, who can blame him? Lightsabers are pretty cool. And he's always like, hey, can we get to the good part? Do we have to watch all of this stuff? I just want to see the lightsaber battles. And, you know, in today's sort of streaming services, it's, it's kind of easy to skip ahead, isn't it? Just, you just skip to the good part, right? But you miss so much. And the story, if there is a story at all, may not make any sense at all. But that's often kind of what we want. Skip to the good part. And generally, as human beings, that's kind of what we want, right? Skip through the hard stuff and get as fast as we possibly can to the good stuff, right? That's kind of how it works. And here's the deal. As the first disciples of Jesus and disciples now of Jesus are we any different? And I think as we enter into our passage today, I think that's kind of what's going on for Jesus' earliest disciples like Peter and John and, and Andrew and James. But Jesus wants us to know the hard news, the hard truth in order to get to the good news, the gospel news, that it's even better than we thought. So we have this hard news good news story today. So I invite you right now to open up your Bibles, your Bible apps, and turn with me to Matthew 24, and we'll start at verse 1. And when you found it, I invite you to stand with me as we hear God's Word. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 14 and then 36 through 42. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, 
You see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all these are but the beginning of the birth pain. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And looking ahead to verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angel of heaven or the son, but the father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the son of man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the son of man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So a few things to note. Um, Before we get into this challenging passage, you probably heard it. This is a pretty challenging passage. This hard news, kind of hear good news in there, message of Jesus. It might be actually helpful for us to note a few things as we listen to Jesus. Now, you may have noticed that the language Jesus was using might be a bit different than just kind of a story language. It doesn't seem to be just telling a story. And that's because, you see, Jesus is the perfect connection between God and mankind. He's in this beautiful role of prophet, priest, and king. And what we have here is Jesus' role of prophet being kind of amplified. And the way he speaks is bringing the past and the present and the future together. And so we often will have kind of symbolic language, particularly from the Old Testament, We'll have this message of truth that applies now and into the future with warnings and encouragement to faith and endurance. And so often we hear the symbolic language of the future, like this end of the age. Like, what is is that? And, And you might even notice that that's what prompts the conversation in the first place. Because the disciples are asking about signs and times and what is coming, this end of the age. But what they're asking about is when is the kingdom of God going to be fully realized, when God is fully with us, ruling? Now, even though they don't really kind of grasp at what they're asking Jesus, they're asking him, when is he coming? When is he coming? And it's a special word in the Greek. It's parousia. Some of you may have even heard of that word before. And it's a a special word referring to Jesus second coming, his coming in fullness. And there's a section in our text that we're not going to kind of focus on, which speaks on the Son of Man coming in glory with the trumpet sound. Uh, Some of you may even sing in your head, behold, he comes. There's like a, a great song that kind of says, here he comes. It's awesome. We're not going to quite get to that. But that's in essence what they're talking about. They're touching on And this doesn't make too much sense to maybe them or to us unless we understand the cross, the resurrection of Jesus, his rising again, and his ascension, and his waiting, his waiting 
in heaven, this parousia coming again. So there's just a few things that just want to note to you as we kind of jump into this hard news, good news passage. Now, as you read it, you're thinking, wow, this passage is a bit of a downer, maybe a bit troublesome and, and, and wearisome and daunting, a bit scary. But when we simplify it a bit, when we simplify it a bit, Jesus makes incredible amount of sense about our world and the church. And that's how we're, we're going to look at the passage. What is Jesus saying about the world, about the culture of life in general? And, and what is Jesus saying about the church, about disciples, Jesus followers? So we're going we're gonna to look at the hard news first. It is hard, but we're going to get to the good news, I promise you. So first, the hard news about the world and the church. So what is the hard news that Jesus is bringing here? Verse 3, it's, it says this, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The disciples are asking, hey, when is this all going to happen? When is this all going to happen? When is this parousia, this coming and ruling going to happen? Jesus, hard news is, not yet. Dang, not yet. And he gives them this series of really hard news warnings and situations that we too are a part of. Verse 4, he says, And Jesus answered them, saying, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will lead many astray. Well, the warning here is about deception, about being led astray by pretenders to Jesus' authority and leading. Presently and into the future, many will believe in the lies of pretenders to salvation. And then verse 6, he says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Wow, conflict on this huge scale. And this fear of violence and conquest, this is the character of the present into the future. And then he says, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But these are just the beginning of the birth pangs. And then they will be delivered into... Uh, and they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Where's the good news in that? This is hard news that disciples will experience. Natural disasters, famine, earthquakes, which are devastating and painful, right? But perhaps worse than that, Trouble and injustice and death and hatred by all the people in all the nations, hated and betrayed. Whew. What hard truth is Jesus giving his disciples then and now? He's saying it's going to be hard. Count the cost. Following Jesus will cost relationships, safety and perhaps even your life. And Jesus doesn't give long explanations as to why. The world is broken and bent against Jesus, so persecution is a reality. Whew. Now, perhaps you felt that a little bit. This strange rejection for being a Christian, just being a Christian, or a hostility to you sharing something about sin and the cross of Jesus or a rejection that maybe Jesus is the only way. Standing in faith is hard. Taking up your cross is hard. And Jesus is giving us hard news, a reality check. Now, now let me tell you a story about the Chinese house church. My experience is very limited, but this is a, a story that just really struck me. And many of you probably have better stories to tell, but this is the one uh, that just really s stays with me. I have this really good friend in Toronto, and he planted this, this church in the kind of the middle of Toronto, right by the university, and he planted this amazing church. And where he planted it was in this cafe. 
So on Sunday mornings, they would meet at this cafe, and the guy who owned the cafe was this wonderful Christian man from China, and it was this beautiful Chinese cafe. And every time I went in there, I saw these incredible paintings. They were huge, really, really big, big paintings, portraits of people's faces, and they were striking and just very bold. And I was like, what? I just love these paintings just because they're amazing, but what's the story? Why are they even up here? What, maybe just someone thought, oh, these are some cool paintings. But I, I went on to discover that those paintings were actually real people. Many young men and women who had died for their faith in the house church in China. They died for believing in the truth of Jesus for meeting together as Christians. They knew how hard the hard news was, but they did it because they knew the good news that is coming. And man, I can't wait to meet those amazing Christians in the parousia, Jesus coming. And so friends, this is hard news. Do you want to skip to the good part yet? Eh, maybe. We do. We all do. I want to, but... Jesus isn't finished. Yay. The second thing we need to look at is the hard news directed more to the church context of faith and worship and the Christian message we might hear. So what's the hard news for the church? Verse 1, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him buildings of the temple. Wow, look at this amazing place of worship, re religious worship. But he answered them, you see all these, don't you? See this temple, how marvelous it is made. Truly I say to you, there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Wow. As Jesus leaves the temple, in this kind of almost symbolic way, turning his back against and on this religious place, after all these woes that you heard last few weeks, this, this place that's been considered the source of worship, where heaven and earth meet, a place where God somehow can be present, Jesus says very directly that the temple is done. It's no longer the place where heaven and earth meet, no longer the dwelling place of God. The temple experience of worship is over. Wow. Imagine being these first Jewish disciples. This would be shocking. How can we worship? Perhaps we could even feel of like, hey, what would happen if we lost our church? It would be devastating, incredibly hard news. Perhaps they felt a bit lost in their faith at this point, right? And a little later on, Jesus says, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. He's talking about life even in the church. He's saying, many will be moved to sin and fall away and betray, even in the church. And we know this is the sad story of Jesus, Judas, right? The story of Judas, one so dear to Jesus, who betrays Jesus for silver. And doesn't this sadly resonate through the course of church history, even in our own day? Sexual abuse, or maybe the abuse of power. And it broke my heart to listen to the damage caused by a leader who abused his power in this, this podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. And many of us have seen Christian leaders trip up and fall in terrible ways. Now I really want to skip to the good stuff. But we press on to hear the fullness of Jesus' message so we can understand the fullness of the good news. And Jesus doesn't end there. He goes on, verse 11, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray, and because lawlessness is increased, the love of many will grow cold. And again, deceptive leaders proclaiming to speak for God, leading so many away from the truth of the gospel. And it's the hard truth that even in the early church, even in the early church, they experienced false teachers, these so-called super apostles who tried to gain money and power and glory for themselves. Oh. I don't know about you, 
when you see a friend or someone you know whose heart seems to be growing cold toward Jesus. Oh, this is hard truth, Jesus. When will it end? When will we get to the good stuff? May I add just one more thing, sorry? The hard news is for the church and the world, we don't actually know when this will end. Exactly. Jesus says in verse 36, but concerning the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. So you or I, not the angels in heaven, they don't know. We don't know when this will end. And Jesus says that only the Father knows. So you and I can't predict or control or force the end. We can't trick or manipulate the end. So just like in Noah's day, judgment was dropped like a ceaseless storm, the same, the parousia, the coming of the Son of Man, it's going to be a surprise. And nothing Anyone in the world, church, or even angels or the devil can do about it. Whew. Does that make the hard news even harder? You see hatred and destruction and betrayal and deception, and we don't know when it will end. Yay, happy Father's Day. But, okay, this is the, this is the, this is the good part. We're kind of leaving a little bit of the darkness and coming into the good news. And the good news, friends, is so good. It's so good. And let the good news have the last word for the church and for the world. Not, it may not seem like good news at first, but just listen in. Listen in. It is good news. Verse 1, Jesus left the temple, right? And going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Look at how great that is, right? A building where, you know, people worship. But he answered them. You see all these, do you not? These, these material things. Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. This is a good thing. It is a good thing. So wait, follow me here. The temple is done because Jesus has won. I just wanted to throw that little rhyme in there. The temple is done because Jesus has won. This is the reality of the incarnate Son of God who has come. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the meeting place of heaven and earth. Jesus is the dwelling place of God. And because all these stones will be thrown down in a war in 70 AD, sometime later, Jesus' prophetic word on Herod's temple is proven absolutely true. But better than an old temple of stone... Jesus actually forms a new temple, and that's you, and that's me, and that's the early disciples. The place of worship, the meeting place of God and humanity, God's dwelling place by His Holy Spirit is you, and it's me. The old way of worship is disrupted and condemned by Jesus, but you see, the good news is even better. God now dwells with you and me personally and corporately as his church, as we gather here today. Oh, that's good news. And it gets better. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And there's a couple of pieces of really good news in here. You may not hear them right away. Two pieces. The endurance or perseverance or standing firm in your faith, guess what? It's not in your strength. It doesn't have to be in your strength. Jesus isn't just saying, hey, work harder, endure harder. You know, he's not saying grit your teeth. No. What he's saying and he's leading us to is that endurance is possible. Why? Because it's by the inevitable and interminable power of God by this gift of the Spirit. He's the one who endures with you. God is very present. He's a very present help in trouble. 
this trouble we've been talking about. He's our refuge and strength. And Hebrews 12 tells us, and this is beautiful, that just as Jesus himself endured the cross, right, the hostility and the hatred of others, that we can experience ourselves. He can give you the heart and strength to endure. Just look to the cross. Just look to Jesus. That's the place of endurance. And the Bible tells us that God himself is the God of endurance. I love in Romans 15, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that's good news. You don't have to endure on your own. God himself is enduring with you. And this beautiful piece also is that that endurance that God is giving you leads to the fullness of salvation, the fullness of salvation. Yes, if you have trusted your life to Jesus, He has forgiven you. Your sin is covered. You have eternal life. You are saved. You are saved. And the fullness of this salvation, the realization of this salvation comes when the end comes, when He comes, this parousia, when He returns in the fullness of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom come. Oh, that's good. Salvation. We are saved, but we have an ultimate, perfect salvation that is coming. So friends, consider what you and I might do to participate in God's work of endurance in your life. How about a few of these ideas? Know God's word. Know God's word so you can recognize a counterfeit teacher. It won't, it won't shock you. It won't surprise you. Like, that's a strong. That doesn't accord with God's word. Pray. Oh, pray for that endurance through suffering that he might bring transformation to your faith and your character and give you the hope by the Holy Spirit. That's just a little Romans 5 for you right there, right? Listen. Listen to the testimony of, in this room of God's grace and salvation right here in our community, our family here at Dunbar. You can do that in home groups and youth group when young adults gather together. Oh, that is a place of endurance and encouragement to our salvation. So yes, the hard news is that Jesus' disciples will experience persecution and hostility, even betrayal, and struggle through wars and violence and natural disasters. The good news is that it will end. It will end. That is a promise. But in the meantime, we actually have a great purpose. And Jesus alludes to that purpose as we wait for the parousia. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And so as we live out this enduring faith that we're called to, we're also called to proclaim the gospel, to live out the gospel, the, this good news of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, his ascension to heaven and his coming again. And this is a message for every people, every young person, old person, and everyone in between. The good news of Jesus. He is coming again in power and glory. And so this message is our mission. And yes, we don't know exactly the day He will return, but we do know that He will. And here's the, here's the sweet spot. And the more people who we invite to know Jesus, imagine the greater joy in heaven when he does return, right? When he does come. And friends, I, I long for my family, my foster boys, to be with me when Jesus comes. And so what do I need to be faithful to this hard news, good news Jesus is telling me? Jesus helps me share that testimony of the gospel, of the kingdom. 
his life and death and, and resurrection as this coming king and power. Lord, send us into our homes, our neighborhoods, our communities to be that witness. Now, our final piece, there's lots more to the good news, obviously, but our final piece of good news from this hard news, good news passage is this. It's the call to wake up. That may not seem like good news at first. Verse 42, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. It's this call to alertness, to readiness, watchfulness to when Jesus will return. So what are we waiting for? We're waiting for Jesus. We're waiting for Jesus. We're waiting for Jesus. What he has done, what he is doing right now, and what he will do. And the question to us is, are you captivated by Jesus? Are you expecting Jesus, longing for Jesus and for this hard news to end? Is that part of our story? He tells us to to stay awake. Friends, what wakes you up in the faith? What wakes you up? What's your spiritual alarm clock? Maybe it's some of those disciplines, right? Those those Christian disciplines, which we're going to be looking at throughout the summer. Maybe that is a great wake-up to our faith. Maybe, for some of you, a wake-up is is a Christian camp where you just come alive and awake in that, that Christian camp, maybe a retreat. Maybe it's every single week at church. You come and it just wakes you up, alerts you, gives you a better picture of what God is doing. Maybe what wakes you up is the mission God has called you to. Hey, this is where God has called me to. He's given me gifts to do these things. I, as I enter into those things, it wakes me up. What wakes you up? And one thing for me, just personally, is foster care. And I could say that I was definitely sleepy towards what God was doing in foster care for many years. But as I enter into this space of foster care, I see the brokenness of the world, the hostility and betrayal that Jesus is talking about in His Word, right? And as I do, how much more do I long for Jesus to make things right that I can't make right? I can participate in His mission, right? Participate in the good news, the work of the kingdom, but so many of these things are beyond my imagination, How about for you? What wakes you up? And maybe are you being a bit sleepy? Do you need that spiritual alarm clock to go off real loud in your ear? So friends, as you can see, we did not skip to the good part. We didn't skip to the good news. We had to hear the hard news, the devastating news first, so that the good news could make just so much more sense. Our sin and sorrow will come to an end. When we endure in the hard news, just listen to this. When we're enduring faithfully in the hard news, aren't we more engaged to do something when we're really alert? Hey, I can can participate. Bring God's justice and righteousness here. Aren't we more awake and alive and ready for the end of this? Like, Lord, when will this end? Aren't we more attuned to that? When we endure through the hard news, aren't we more moved to the mission that God has given us to proclaim the good news so this era will indeed end? So friends, doesn't Jesus' hard news, good news, make you more aware of how hard the hard is and how truly good the good news of salvation is? Doesn't it move us to glorify God all the more to know that Jesus is coming, the parousia is coming to make all things new. And so we can say with the very last book of the Bible, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, amen.